to be able to get this right with so many mutual interests. This historic first meeting of the, these two chapters, um, the most active chapters, among the most active chapters of, in the Cornet family, features a distinguished panel that will be discussing. I'm just going to briefly describe the topics, um, but these panelists uh, will take this conversation where it needs to go. First, the attraction of talent and incentives that municipalities and states are offering to attract talent. How companies and communities are seeking new and better jobs for underrepresented populations and communities. The potential impacts of remote working, increasingly uh, a larger reality in all of our lives on the economic fortunes of communities of color and how the evolving landscape for corporate location decisions, including financial incentives and the pursuit of public and corporate policy goals around access to economic opportunity are influencing how companies go about choosing locations. First, I'd like to acknowledge the Vice Coastal organizers of this very timely and important event from the Public Policy Committee of the New York Chapter, Courtney Grill, and Pursuits and Capture Manager for Faith and Gould, Marcus Rayner, Vice Chair of Colliers New York Region, and Marty Cunningham, Principal at Avis and Young. From the Programs Committee of the North, Northern California Chapter, I'd like to also thank my colleague, Andy Shapiro, Managing Director of VLS, Rafi Espiritu, President and CEO of Impact Group, and Julia Campbell, partner of uh, Quisada Architecture. My name is Jay Biggins. I'm your moderator today, Managing Principal at Location Advisors, Biggins, Lacey Shapiro. It is my distinct pleasure and privilege to introduce our panelists today. First, Ann Bansberger, recently head of workplace planning at Genentech South San Francisco headquarters, a workplace advisor specializing in communications, collaboration, and connections across networks. Mike Grella, founder and principal with Grella Partnership Strategies and the former Economic Development Policy Lead for AWS, engaging with governments with scaling their global infrastructure and footprint. Jeannie Esperanda, Head of Global Workplace Initiatives at J.P. Morgan Chase, and prior to that, Executive Director of the Job Opportunity Investment Network, um, and the first Director of Human Capital Investments at the City of Philadelphia under Mayor Michael Nutter, who's one of my favorite mayors. Uh, Mona Pascal Rogers, California Policy Lead for uh, Facebook. Unfortunately, Mona. Uh, had to attend to an urgent family health matter today and regret she will not be able to join us. We all send our thoughts and prayers to Mona and her family. I will say that this panel has already benefited immensely from her input as we prepared for this discussion, but she will be missed. We plan to spend about 45 minutes discussing these topics that really arrive at the intersection of competitiveness of states and cities and how companies primarily around a, the, the, the leading variable, which is talent, and how companies and public officials can collaborate to advance economic plus social justice goals. We will be leaving about 15 minutes for your Q&A. Which pose a question, please do so via the chat room. We'll be monitoring these. We'll try to address as many as time allows, but please also know that we've made arrangements to follow up after this event with responses to any questions with, that we were unable to address live today. Really, this event is being recorded both, chapter and, uh, both chapters are making plans to share the content online and to also have it summarized in written form. So please stay tuned and we look forward to discussing this with you in an interactive way. The first of our topics is attracting diverse talent, the incentives, strategies of states and municipalities. To set the stage, we have an immense onset of teleworking, in, which was already well entrenched and growing, but accelerated by COVID. In April, McKinsey reported that 62 percentage of American employers were working from home compared to just 25% a year ago. We also have migration from expensive markets to more affordable markets. 39% uh, of, dwell of city dwellers said that they would be considering leaving for less crowded space. And that number has no doubt expanded. We have states, counties, and cities all innovating with ways of attracting talent. These are locations that are not San Jose, they're not New York, they're not San Francisco, uh, they're not even the second tier emerging markets. These are locations that are offer affordable environments, uh, but are seeking talent so that they can become competitive in a more distributed workforce environment. 
innovations such as uh, Vermont and Savannah all offering incentives to employees to residents who move there. A program called Choose Topeka, Maine also offering exciting incentives, and New York also entering the fray. Nonprofit institutions such as the Kaiser Foundation also are weighing in. The first question for our panelists is the following. If, as many contend, our economy will return to a condition of historic labor shortages that, that existed pre-COVID, particularly for skilled talent, what do you believe will be the proper roles of the public and private sectors in talent attraction and retention? Now, in order to sort of keep things um, in, 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 uh, in on track here, we're gonna start first with Anne, followed by Mike and Jenny, and then we'll reverse the order for the following question. Panelists, please have a go. Thank you, Jay. It's nice to be here. I am um, always pleased to be with such a nice and involved group of folks and East Coast, West Coast makes it even more interesting. Um, I'm sorry that Mona's not here. She would help me shore up the West Coast, but I'm sure um, all of you are, are well enough familiar that you know things tend to happen on the West Coast and East Coast and then spread in some fashion. Um, this topic is of great interest and should be of great interest to all of us. Although what I find initially fascinating is that you're talking to a bunch of real estate people, not necessarily public policy people who often reside in government relations or corporate relations, and then the states, the, 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 the public sector. Um, I find that this is a fabulous time for us to try to bridge those worlds. Um, we who are often responsible for master planning, campus planning, um, and now increasingly, um, in my opinion, planning a more of a network of places on behalf of the real estate portfolio. Um, it's really challenging to try to figure out if the COVID acceleration necessarily translates into an easy network of places. So I think the assumption is there's going to be a distributed event. More people are likely and able to work from home and, and I, I was hoping Mona could speak to the, some of the Facebook press that we've, that we've recently heard about how um, Zuckerberg is, is, is portending that a, a large population, I think it was as much as half over the next five to 10 years, would be working outside of um, the Bay Area necessarily. What, what I find fascinating is that I haven't heard, and this is a question I'd like to pass over to Mike and and um, our, our other panelists whose name I've forgotten, forgive me. Um, what, what again is your name? I, I should remember it. Jenny. Yes. Jenny, so sorry, Jenny, because you're with That's the right. That would be very, very, very important to know. Um, and Mike also, because he's been at Amazon and Amazon to me seems to be one of the first that sort of is actually making this happen the connection between areas and potential employers and also reaching underserved populations. I'm, I'm not convinced that companies like Genentech that have a unique workforce that are retracting PhDs in science have the same kind of opportunity, but I definitely want to talk about that and address that because we are very much, or at least we were very much, I'm no longer there, interested in diversity and inclusion and approaching um, underserved communities in order to attract a different mindset and a different type of workforce. But um, let me go back to what I was saying in that what I'm not seeing is a, the COVID translation to groups of people. At the moment, COVID allows individuals to work from home. Um, I'm not sure that a network of places means everybody works from home and that therefore becomes a real estate event. Um, I'm much more interested in, in, in having some of a conversation with, with my colleagues about, well, how do you groupize that? And I think Amazon's figured it out because they have a place with, with which they can recruit local talent. Some of us don't have that benefit. Some of us have local talent that we'd like to recruit, but it may be onesie twosies, and that's a little trickier than approaching a community or a public sector about a significant amount of property. So let me just, my position is, I think this is awesome. And I'm really curious how to best merge all the different perspectives and come up with maybe one or two things that we can take away from today that give us ideas about what we as real estate professionals could do next. Mike? 
Those are great points. Uh, I would add that or start with you know, Amazon years ago started a program called VCC, Virtual Customer Care. And what they did was uh, they had a, they had grown out their physical footprint in brick and mortar call centers in Kentucky and uh, Washington State, in uh, West Virginia, Costa Rica, et cetera. And then it started hiring clusters of people in areas uh, if they had broadband connectivity and went through the proper training, et cetera, to be essentially call center employees working from home and were able to recruit them in bunches and in areas and also made an effort to recruit and work with the military veterans hiring group to go to places outside of like uh, Joint Base Lewis McCord outside of Seattle and other military bases where there are uh, military spouses uh, that are looking for work and other uh, returning veterans that might be looking for opportunities. And so I do believe that there are cluster strategy opportunities from a remote work perspective. I do think that there's also an opportunity to promote diversity, inclusion, and equity in a way that hasn't been achieved in Silicon Valley in Seattle. Uh, we have to look at diversity through different lenses, gender diversity, tech has a long way to go. Uh, in terms of people of color, if you're talking about uh, black and brown, Latinx population, uh, tech particularly uh, has really underperformed in terms of uh, hiring talent, and that may apply to life sciences and other technical fields, but part of that is a supply program uh, problem. And uh, it really what that means is the responsibility is on, I believe, the employers uh, as part of their corporate social responsibility strategy to plant the seeds for DEI into the pipeline. And uh, that's in urban cities, that's throughout America, through different training programs. But there's also an opportunity with remote work, if you're in a connected community, to reach out and recruit diverse populations. So uh, you know, to my knowledge, Amazon hasn't set up an office in Memphis, Tennessee, or New Orleans yet, but you can go to cities that have majority minority or plurality minority uh, black and brown population and look to set up opportunities and intentionally recruit workers that have the right skill sets to meet those needs. Uh, so I do think that there's a role for uh, remote work recruitment and training in those communities of color. So it's, it's a matter of both corporate social responsibility, but also corporate self-interest with unemployment rate historically low. It's critical that companies both prepare and access uh, uh, you know, underemployed workforces going forward. Jenny? Yeah, Mike, you, you teed me up well because I sit in corporate responsibility at J.P. Morgan Chase. And my job is historically been focused externally. What kind of commitments and investments are we making in communities to build more inclusive talent pathways? I think excitingly for J.P. Morgan and, and selfishly for me, uh, over the last couple of years, that role has um, evolved to include close partnership with the lines of business, with HR, with global technology, to think about how we are harmonizing our external efforts with what we are doing internally in the company. And I credit um, our CEO, certainly, who is not shy about these, these topics, but also our, our senior leaders on really um, I think making sure that we're walking the walk in addition to talking the talk and that we're kind of really not to speak only in, uh, you know, uh, uh, like trite cliches here, but that we're also putting our action where our mouth is, which as I think for all of us working in big organizations is a complicated and nuanced proposition. So um, I'm happy to share a little bit about what that's looking like for us, how we continue to evolve this work. I think um, Jay, your question sets us up, you know, and just, you mentioned everybody's backgrounds, and I'm, I'm really excited to be here today with all of you. 
I think what was very appealing to me about joining the team at JP Morgan was the fact that I've been working on these issues from the public and nonprofit side. So I am a, I kind of consider myself an urban policy person at my core. I somehow morphed into a bit of a foundation person and now I'm a, a corporate person. But to me, what was very clear um, and continues to be clear is that we're not necessarily speaking the same language across sectors on this topic, and we're definitely not speaking along the same time horizon. So one of the things we've been trying to advance with our uh, corporate responsibility agenda at the firm is how do we invest in organizational capacities and intermediaries who can more clearly bring together public, private, social sectors along this issue of inclusive talent development, because many times we do need that intermediating function, that translational function to help businesses who I think are well-intentioned many times, but not, not necessarily picking their heads up and sending those clear demand signals, not necessarily working at scale um, in terms of partnering with other companies to say, you know what, 80% of what we're looking for in certain kinds of tech jobs are what Amazon's looking for or what, uh, you know, Accenture is looking for. And if we spend time focusing on lifting up what is common across companies, we're better positioning educational institutions, governments, and others to kind of need us, you know, sort of part of the way uh, and make sure that, you know, on the supply side, they're, they're thinking about um, their role here and and we're kind of centering equity and, and I appreciate Mike's point, you know, thinking about racial equity, gender equity, um, socioeconomic equity in that work. Um, the, one, the one other point I just make before um, I pause is that I hope you're right, Jay, that we're moving back towards that full employment economy. I will say that pre-COVID, um, we were preparing ourselves there's certainly, we were thrilled with where the labor market is in the United States, but I am a bit troubled by the occupational mix within that job market. And, you know, that increased polarization that we're seeing that I think COVID is likely exacerbating. And this question of how are we pulling more people into good jobs that sustain families, that enable you to work one job and not three in order to kind of get a toehold in your you know, sort of social economic mobility and how are we helping people transition from jobs that aren't there um, that provide them with lots of great foundational skills but what are those pathways across and between and I think those are getting more complicated and we have a role all of us together to figure out which strengths we can leverage to to make those pathways uh, you know realities rather than talking points. No I think what I find fascinating about what you said Jenny is that you're in a position <clears throat> where you actually see a responsibility on the part of the corporation, a social responsibility. I don't think any of our companies would deny that they all have a social responsibility, but I think it varies from company to company to company, which is the point that I think you're making. Also, I also wonder, we haven't really talked about what is the public sector responsibility. Um, in my experience in real estate, and I see that locally, you know, it's kind of whenever you want to try to do something in terms of expanding, the public sector wants you to build the roads and it wants you to take care of all of the, the, the public ailments. And I think companies at this point in particular may not have the deep pockets they had before. So, and I also think it varies by sector. I think high tech, lucky high tech, you know, they, they're doing fine. They're, they're keeping the stock market going. Um, but does that mean we should burden them with the responsibility that might be shared by other sectors? I don't know. So that's sort of a sociopolitical yeah. question that I'll, um, I'll open Which, up. I, I know that Genentech is also doing okay, not great, because people need medicine in spite of COVID. Now, if I were in hospitality, I, I'm not sure I'd know what to do. Right, that, that's a, a good segue into our next question, uh, which is, um, you know, if we, if, we, if we think about what uh, our, all of our responsibilities are, which has got to be measured to some extent by our capacity, uh, we, we have to sort of think about a temporary situation where a lot of institutions, financial institutions, 
in all sectors, uh, especially hospitality, retail, are are in the ditch right now, and some others, as you said, are, are basically carrying carrying the equity markets. Um, but we have to look, pick our heads up out of the foxhole at some point, and look, you know, up on the horizon when we can expect perhaps a triggered recession, but then at some point a recovery, and some point back to uh, fuller employment. Mm -hmm. Still, full employment has meant different things in different sectors. It's you know pushing basically zero in some sectors and has been you know 15 or higher in others. Uh, it's critical that that government and business get together around the need to develop the talent pipeline. It's in all of our mutual interests. What governments are doing on kind of a blocking and tackling basis, though, be a, you know beyond the, the the inherent challenges of long-term public policy planning. Uh, is uh, dealing with their incentives programs. Um, increasingly, jurisdictions are focusing on the triple bottom line and different variations on that theme and requiring different things in consideration for incentives. And companies, uh, while they may immediately may feel as if this is an exaction, an imposition, if it's in the right, if it's in the right areas, like workforce development, is actually an alignment of interests. Um, we're seeing a number of jurisdictions, uh, such as Durham County, North Carolina, who, in addition to wanting to see high-paying new jobs, also want to know what the jobs are at the entry level and want you to document what they are and what you're going to do to, to create access for the jobs. We're seeing this, uh, you know, in an organic way across the country, um, from state, cities, and, and, uh, and, and all local subdivisions. The question for the panel is, state and local jurisdictions have been using incentives to create jobs and in, in investment and in targeted geographies forever. But these new outcome-based, these new triple bottom line oriented incentives will hopefully be more effective in creating a broader engagement and a broader, a, a, a broader enjoyment of benefits of a development. What are your recommendations to state and local policymakers as they continue to try to innovate on this frontier of economic development? Let's start, let's reverse the order. Jenny, let's start with you. I, this, this is not my intent to keep Michael in the middle. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, he is in the middle on my, on my, on my. I was gonna say. I'm, he's, yeah, he's, that's right. So, so yeah. let's, let's okay. maybe, let's maybe uh, each spend maybe five minutes on our, on our main, uh, on our main response, and then we can have rebuttal and, and, and a colloquy to help, to help develop the issue. Jenny? Yeah. Thanks, and no, I promise, I promise not to filibuster. Um, I, I think it's a great question, and you know, I'll give a little bit of a caveat that at the firm we have teams, um, and I'm sure people on this call interact with some of uh, my colleagues on this topic. So I, I'm going to speak a little bit about it from the lens of our engagement with other cities, uh, sort of in, in the external facing view, but I'll also bring some of that experience working uh, back in Philadelphia just on this topic, frankly, uh, specifically, I, I do think the move towards more outcomes and impact-oriented measures is, is pretty essential. Um, I also just found over the years as somebody who's focused on issues of jobs and skills and workforce development that the numbers that economic development professionals use to plan versus the numbers that human capital focused uh, stakeholders need to use to make plans are very different, right? You're gonna come in and uh, perhaps tend to certain extremes if you're trying to anticipate the impact of that airport expansion project or what have you. But when it comes to then developing educational training programs at the community college to meet that need, oftentimes we find that the scope, the scale and specificity of those projections don't necessarily align with what you need to develop and uh, I think implement those kinds of training pathways that again are, are part and parcel of what we're doing through our corporate responsibility agenda at JP Morgan Chase. So I think that the the sort of more outcomes oriented frames are, are what we need here. Um, I think also this might relate to where we go next, but, and I'm kind of picking up on Anne's point previously, the public infrastructure 
for workforce development is one that has been, I think, to be fair, historically underinvested in or disinvested in over time. And there's going to have to be work to be done to really modernize that infrastructure and make sure that it can even receive the um, any sort of increase in scale or utilization. It just brings me back to the recovery period in kind of 08 and 09, where we saw all of that underinvestment, disinvestment over time result in a really leaky pathway when we then aim to rush people funding other kind of support through it. So, you know, I think Anne's absolutely right. There is a lot that has to be kind of improved upon and built out there for any of this to work well. You know, and if I may just just amplify that, Jenny, I, that be, that has been one of my major concerns. I mean, and you've seen this particularly in California. Those of you who know California, most companies are providing their own transportation services, which does a disservice to the public transportation service. So we just create a a broader gap, and it just feels like now's the time to try to take those resources and work collaboratively and collectively and. We're working, and Genentech's working with multiple other companies to partner on the transportation, and there doesn't seem to be the traction with the public sector. So my, 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 my sincere wish is that the public sector, we help them help themselves so they can help us. So maybe it's a shifting of resources back into the public sector. Maybe the only way to do it is through development, but I'm, I'm not seeing large development. Maybe Amazon is doing it. But Genentech certainly is not building another campus in Philadelphia in the near future. So if we want to recruit and retain under um, serviced individuals in another geography, all of those questions come up. How do they get taken care of? How do they get serviced? Um, and onesie twosie just doesn't work very well. I think, if, if in my opinion, a concentration, a, a, a site where there are needs that can be serviced with a little bit of scale to me, I think is way, way, way more impactful than obviously the next question, which is how do you use remote work to help help fuel this? So Jenny, I don't have the answer. I mean, I think you're probably closer, or maybe Mike is. Um, what has been your experience? And, and Jay was talking about Durham County, which I think is interesting. Other examples that you guys are aware of, of where the public sector actually is doing as much as they could be or should be, or do you see opportunities for the private sector to help them. That's a broad agenda right there. We've just covered transit and workforce development and they're all interrelated. Some yeah, all are heavy, some are more program heavy. Yeah. Um, Mike, what's your perspective? Yeah, I think we also need to break this not just into industries, but type of facilities like e-commerce and logistics and data centers mm -hmm. are completely different animals than corporate offices and commercial office developments. Amazon announced a few weeks ago that they're building a thousand last mile delivery stations, which may well mean that they're building 1,500 or 2,000 last mile delivery stations. Um, it, the, in addition to the million square foot warehouses, and then you've got, uh, you know, the, the rest of the e-com gang, you've got Target and Walmart and Kroger and a whole bunch of other players. And so, you know, there are tens of billions of dollars of capital deployed and tens of thousands of construction and permanent jobs that are being created right now. Yeah. It doesn't necessarily affect Genentech or necessarily JP Morgan Chase in the same way. And so when we talk about what are, you know, what's the right public policy outcome, I always think of, and I advise my clients particularly, government clients is when you're coming up with a public-private partnership to determine a potential level of support, certainly an economic and fiscal impact analysis makes sense, but you also need to look at the externalities of what that investment is. Is there environmental effluent and cleanup that's gonna need to take place? Is there gonna be traffic? Are you gonna have to hire additional teachers and firemen and uh, police women, et cetera, and first responders? Are you going to have to pave the roads five years from now? You know, computing, figuring out what those externalities are and bringing them to the forefront and having a candid conversation about corporate responsibility that says, if I'm going to put up an e-commerce warehouse with 3,000 people 
the hundreds of trucks are going to come in, at, in and out of every day. Does it make sense that I don't pay any real estate taxes and when the roads need to be paved that that's the burden of the rest of the community that aren't using that and vice versa. And yes, should you be rewarded for those jobs? Is there a benefit in a increment? I think that there's a conversation to be had that there should be support from an infrastructure standpoint, from a workforce development, from a recruiting standpoint, from uh, environmental sustainability and promoting energy efficiency, use of renewables, et cetera. But I, I, I come back to, are we looking at what the externalities are? And if you're putting 300 people in an office building, there typically aren't a lot of externalities. But if you're building a you know, build it billion dollar chip fabrication plant, or an e-commerce facility, or a big box retail facility, or a chemical manufacturing plant, you need to be mindful of that. And I would say that that along with the fiscal impact and the community impact uh, should all be weighed appropriately in the decision of how heavily, if at all, to provide public subsidies. So on, on that, um, I mean, w the, the fiscal impact and, and economic impact analyses that, that we're associated with typically are looking at those other issues. They exist. Um, you can't talk about fiscal impact without doing projections for what those impacts are actually going to be. And, and that's the, 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 it's become a more wide angled analytic uh, protocol, which is, which is healthy. You know, with regard to the, you know, how incentives are used, you know, at the margin, companies are looking for a cost competitive location. That doesn't mean zero taxes. Right. It does mean mm -hmm. that, you know, incentives are really a pricing tool and, and the choice of place is a procurement decision. Mm -hmm. Cost is never far from the top of the list, but it's never the only issue. Uh, and, and increasingly issues such as access to talent, as well as quality of life are, are more heavily in the balance. So our next question sort of begins to migrate. You know, we've, this, the topic for this event was, was you know, what's happening with, with going forward with our cities, but it's really more about what's happening with the residents. You know, cities are there to, for people. And, and so what we're seeing now, we're flipping to the other side of the equation. I think, Anne, we were talking originally about the ordering principle around this whole discussion really needs to be about supply and demand. Mm -hmm. Uh, we never get too far uh, from that, from the gravity of those realities. Um, but when we're talking now about about um, about talent and accessing talent, and it will continue and hopefully be the same extreme challenge that it was uh, before COVID, uh, which will motivate everybody to sort of invest in the right channels to de develop talent and hopefully with a long-term view. But increasingly, what was already happening before COVID is that the expensive polar capitals of Keck in West and East Coast were already beginning to lose ground because companies were doing long-term studies about costs and about access. Emerging tertiary, secondary tertiary cities are, are, are really getting a foothold. California has been you know, a, the particular target uh, for those uh, kinds of uh, of economic development initiatives by other in other states. Post COVID is no doubt accelerated it, to a, a, a substantial degree, a level of work from home and other teleworking formats uh, that was probably in the cards anyway. Uh, I don't think anybody thinks we're going back to the same density of occupancy uh, that we experienced uh, just a few months ago in, in the very near future. But distributive workforce, uh, while onesies and twosies present as challenges, and certainly companies such as Amazon that can aggregate, you know, hundreds of people in almost any city uh, of their choosing, uh, and have it make sense for their business model, um, it's still interesting to look at the extent to which distributive workforce creates opportunities, where people of limited means who might have to work three jobs to get that toe hold. Um, in New York or San Francisco might only need two or hopefully one in a, in a lower cost market where they can also have a strong quality of life. Yeah. Companies are definitely looking at how to mine resources that are, have feet and that are moving. Uh, this is challenging for our downtowns in our major cities because, because they're gonna lose some demand, they're gonna lose foot traffic and local spending. But what are, what are you all seeing? 
with regard to this ongoing and now accelerated distributed workforce trend in terms of it being itself a ticket and a means to greater diversity and greater opportunity. Let's start with Mike this time. I'm well, not in the middle. Okay, caught me off guard. We, uh, <laughs> I knew he was going to do that. No. I, it's really hard I to do, that Mike, so I'm, I'm, I'm feeling pretty good. <laughs> I, knew that. Uh, I, I think that th there's, as we referred to before, there, there's tremendous opportunity um, to recruit talented workers outside of the primary secondary cities. I see a couple of issues and challenges. Uh, one is the need for the creative uh, collisions that happen, particularly in some of the semi-conditions where they really depend on having teams that are in a more public facing environment uh, working together uh, to solve complicated problems versus, uh, you know, what we call what we called at Amazon, team roles versus individual contributor roles. That I can work from home, I can work in a distributed environment if I'm filling out a tax return or if uh, I'm on the finance team. But if I'm designing the next iteration of an Alexa or an iPhone, I'm probably working in some sort of laboratory uh, environment and needing that in-person collaboration. So quickly, two other issues uh, I see. One is um, the, the skills gap challenge in some of these areas. Certainly people can move to other low cost areas, but I still think that there's gonna be an interest in hiring people and establishing some sort of cluster strategy or scale, even if it's virtual. Somebody that can be having some sort of HR function or it could be a co-working space where in, let's say, Roanoke, Virginia, uh, an Amazon or an Apple or a Google has a couple thousand square feet with some core people that are responsible that can uh, oversee what's going on in the field. And uh, you, you really, I find it hard that you could leave people to their own devices for years upon end and have them be high performers without any sort of mentoring or interaction. Uh, the third challenge is the digital divide is a lot of uh, inherently the lower cost jurisdictions are less likely to be fully connected and you're going to find broadband gaps. And so you're going to need to ensure that, you know, whether it's through USDA, EDA, combination of state funding, uh, I think Stephen Murray and the folks in Virginia uh, are probably on the bleeding edge of solving the rural broadband challenge and they look like they can get to 98, 99% in a few years. It would be great if we could do that everywhere, but I think that uh, we're, we're gonna have to handle in a public private manner, addressing the lack of consistent connectivity and that uh, with 5G be uh, becoming more ubiquitous and proliferated, it's gonna go to the rural and tertiary communities last. It's just, that's the economic selfish model with edge computing and 5G. IOT and most smart city technology. So there, I think there'll be some challenge and barriers in terms of deploying technologies that allow for uh, workers to be efficient and get their jobs done and be fully connected in these cities unless we're able to come up with a successful model where scaling broadband in less populated areas uh, becomes cost effective, cost effective, which right now it is not. Jenny, what's your perspective, uh, not limited to the financial services industry, but starting there and then broader with your experience? Yeah, it's, I think like a lot of folks, we kind of collectively held our breath when we moved very quickly to all remote. And, you know, I think one of the things that, you know, Jamie Diamond on down has spoken about is that it's really amazing what you see happen when you have no other choice. So transitions that would have taken weeks or months, you know, to move people into role, you know, roles where they're working remotely, who heretofore have been, you know, very based in either a call center or an operations center. Um, it's amazing what you do under <laughs> when you have to, right? So I, I think hopefully the takeaway from that is a positive one around agility and the fact that we can be flexible, we can pivot, we can pivot. I think for us, you know, the way I'm thinking about this 
is very much the way we were thinking about the future of work more broadly, which is, you know, I think we can all think back a year and a half and real, you know, there was that discussion, robots are taking the job, there will be no jobs left, the job apocalypse. And then there were people on the other side of the coin, you know, jobs aren't, jobs have always been changing. It's not going to be a dramatic shift. Um, nothing is going to be different. And I think we've tried to see ourselves someplace in the middle in all cases. And I think my guess is that that's going to happen here to some extent, that we are going to become more flexible than we were and we would have been. Um, but I think we're seeing this as evolution, not revolution in, in our industry for now. I think one interesting point in, in, in Jay's question, something that, you know, from my position, we're, we're trying to think of very hard about is that how do you um, opportunistically take advantage of some of these shifts is that people who have been historically locked out of these opportunities have more access. So I'll just give one quick example and then, Anne, I would love your perspective, which is we had kind of small clusters of jobs at the firm that we had piloted moving to remote, which enabled people to balance, you know, work and life in different ways and enabled you not to be as reliant on transportation to get to certain kinds of locations. So we've done this in, in sort of small pockets in the company. And I think right now we're taking a look at how might we be able to do that in a more expanded way. Um, we hear feedback all the time. You know, I'll give one example. In Texas, in Dallas, where we have a significant corporate responsibility agenda at play, we hear from people all the time. There are great jobs that are growing in the suburbs, but I can't get to them. So I think a question for us is if we move to sort of a model like Mike's describing, where maybe occasionally you're going into a certain kind of office setting or hub, but there is more that you can do, you know, sort of at home or remotely, does that enable us to much more intentionally link either more diverse populations into some of those jobs or, you know, sort of expand the talent pool so that we're, we're getting to people who have just not been able to, to get to the job physically or access it. I think the point around um, connectivity and broadband is huge. And the other point that this raises for us all the time is childcare and lack thereof, lack of high quality, affordable childcare. What does that mean? particularly for women who are often in those caregiver roles. I know we're now running short on time, so I'll try to keep this short so that I'm, I'm really interested in some of the, the questions from our colleagues um, out there. The one thing, I, you know, I think everybody who knows me knows that I've been um, a, a, an advocate of distributed work for the last 20 years. And for me, it, it has just become like, thank you, you know, not thank you COVID for all the downside, but thank you that people are now sort of seeing that the workforce is not lazy and the workforce doesn't have to be seen to be able to contribute and add value. So from my perspective, this is, this is the time for all of us as real estate professionals to jump on this bandwagon, experiment like crazy. Don't try to get it right because nobody's going to get it right. And as Mike was saying, which I think is really important, we're all a little bit different. You know, at some level, there are similarities, but man, oh man, if you are a warehousing company, you're going to have place. If you're an IP company or you're a consulting company, you're not going to need it. And those people have already been doing this for years. This is not new at all. And what this is going to do, it's going to put a kick in the pants of, of the video folks who've been struggling with getting video right for the last 20 years because nobody really wanted it. There was no use case because everybody was really snuzzy and cozy going back to their campuses and going back to their offices and seeing their managers and doing the water cooler. And all that stuff is totally doable. Um, again, there are preferences. And I think the way I'd like to leave my thought on this is there's no one answer. And it's a combination of, is the work suitable for working remotely? Some of it's not. Is the work supported by working remotely? If you don't have Wi-Fi, and the answer is no. And then lastly, which we always forget, is what's the preference of the worker? What does the worker want? And what we've seen is the worker has finally had the opportunity to say, look guys, look corporations, I don't wanna go in every day. I don't need to go in every day. I wouldn't mind going in two or three days a week, but not five days a week. And this is, the sky is clean. We've saved money on gasoline. There's so many benefits to not having everybody be on the road, you know, schlepping to one site when really you may just be sitting at your space 
and not necessarily collaborating with others anyway. So focus on teams, focus on collaboration, try to make distributed work because the other stuff we can always weave in. Um, that's Plus we're getting from right now. As Plus we're getting two hours a day back from commuting that we can all be working totally. As soon as we're right. done, right. Right. learning from home, as soon as we're done and my daughters are back in school, I'm all about staying home and working from home. But having three school-aged daughters that are on three separate Zooms at home all day long while I'm on separate Zoom calls and they're screaming at each other, that paradigm is just so challenging as a parent and single parent. Uh, to have to deal with that of, of being a mom or a dad and a referee and also a worker at the same time. Well, what a fabulous opportunity for us. I mean, this audience is, is, is in the corporate real estate function and we now have excess space. So rather than you know, bemoan the fact that we have to get rid of space and that there's not gonna be a commercial, what an opportunity to get ourselves into that network of places and come up with alternatives to working from home that is not the main campus. So. But Get Let's yourself open the floor. Of, sorry, Jay. No, I was going to say, and I see it. I hear where you're going. What you're doing is opening the floor to our colleagues here. Oh like, my goodness, yes, because they all know that you know we could be very, very valuable here in terms of we're good at working cross-functionally. We've worked with HR. We've worked with IT. Now let's work with the corporate responsibility people and and make this sing at least in our different sectors. So anyone out there, you can use the chat room or just put your hand up and uh, hopefully our, 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 uh, our systems meisters here will figure out a way to recognize you and, and give you access. But anyone, and, and by the way, if, if you'd rather defer your questions to later, our panel still has plenty to say. So we can definitely continue this dialogue uh, along the tracks that we've, uh, that we've already opened up here, but barely, barely scratched the surface of. Anyone want to volunteer quest either questions or probably as if not more valuable insights on how your company is handling these, this cross current of challenges and opportunities. Okay, we got one here. So can someone interpret it for me? The public transportation question or? Do companies partner with NGOs to reach out to the underserved is the question, the first huh. question. Interesting. I think, I think so, uh, okay. Mike, and we do. So I'll give a couple of examples. Um, and actually one relates to Jay's point at the start. Um, we, we were given a really, I think, exciting charge uh, a year ago now. It feels like three lifetimes ago. But the question was, can JP Morgan do more to hire people who had had some criminal justice involvement? And there had been an FDIC rule that for a long time, I think we interpreted pretty broadly, but we're also concerned, you know, drew some pretty blanket um, regulations across who we could hire, who we could work with. So we did two things that I think are illustrative and maybe related to what we want to talk about here, which is, um, one, we went and petitioned the FDIC for a rule change so that um, people who had um, criminal justice involvement that had nothing to do with what their job would be at the firm um, would no longer be, you know, blanket um, sort of um, precluded from applying for jobs at the company. But then the other thing we did was we recognized we didn't necessarily have connections to great nonprofit organizations or other organizations who were um, working with this population specifically. So we built those relationships and we worked with HR to figure out what kind of roles might be a fit. And we also recognized that JP Morgan might not be your first stop in your career uh, after you had some sort of justice involvement. But if you'd already been you know, working and working well in other jobs, other industry, we could very well be the next step on your career journey. So for us, NGOs are a real part of our kind of diversity, equity, and inclusion pathway, particularly when we're thinking about um, populations who we have historically not sort of 
intentionally brought into employment here at the firm. And I know other companies, Amazon has done a lot of great work in this space and um, IBM and some others as well. So there, there's, there are a lot of good examples to look to. I see a couple of questions that could be connected. The what do you yeah. do for remote workers and um, what are the future of cities if work is distributed? See, I, 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 my, again, my position is that we're talking about distributed or distance. I'm, I'm less keen on what's called remote because I'm not sure people want to be remote. Remote sort of connotes out of sight, out of mind, always has for the last few years. So uh, my, my wish is that we start thinking about distributed and that we create a network and that that network, it's kind of like how technology networks work, their nodes, nice. there's yeah. packets of information, there's important, I mean, if anyone has done any social network analysis, you know that there's gonna be places that are the hub for certain kind of intellectual capital. So personally, I think what you do for the distributed community is make sure they have fabulous technology and fabulous management. And that they, when they group eyes, you know, when they form teams, that they spend some time working on what I would call a social norm so that it's not chaos, but you've got team agreements around how you're gonna find each other, you know, who's in charge of what. I mean, it's, it's all about agile teaming. They're already doing that now, but they're doing it in place. Whereas in technology years ago, we were doing virtual 24 by seven uh, software design. Now that's a different animal, but if you look at that and try to turn that into how could distributed work work, there's a lot there. And there's a lot about scrumming that has everything to do with behavior. So it's not so much the technology, it's not so much the physical infrastructure, it's gonna be making we human beings be more adaptive to technology and, and, and creating norms that are not just about my preference, but about the preference of the group. So I'm less concerned about individuals like popping up everywhere. I'm more concerned about having it be a very interesting ecosystem where everybody feels like they're part of something, whether it's a community, whether it's a company, whether it's got social responsibility. And I think our millennials are gonna be much more interested in that stuff than you know, some of the ones who are now in public sector jobs or the head of the United States of America. So I think we're gonna see a lot of opportunity for us to play on the margins and, and, and create, those, create those opportunities. Speaking of the margins, one of the other questions relates to the suburbs. So we were talking about jobs moving to, uh, we'll say the heartland, uh, uh, so long as there's broadband access, uh, but there's a microcosm of the same dynamic going on within major metros. Mm -hmm. uh, and companies are looking uh, with, with uh, folks working at home voluntarily or involuntarily, um, as the case may be, depending upon schools and, and kids at home and so on. Um, companies are looking at creating satellite offices that are distributed themselves uh, where employees can go a couple of days a week um, when, uh, when their kids stop fighting uh, and, <laughs> and, and get connection, get mentoring, get, get for training and, 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 other, and other benefits of, of, of being connected physically. Um, what's your perception? No, and at the same time, in most, but not all markets, the suburban office building was basically considered um, on, on the list of endangered species. Um, so uh, as, and malls, frankly, are another asset class that, that may have um, in, a, in a way that can actually inform public policy and create a supply of, a, of, of assets that can be adaptively reused for combinations of work, play, learn, environments um, uh, to, to, uh, to salvage asset classes that have uh, a useful purpose um, out in suburban markets. What do the panelists think about that dynamic surrounding uh, this sort of COVID provoked, uh, if not wholly COVID caused dynamics? I think there's going to be a complete reinvention and reimagination of suburban commercial uh, office space. The, the mall concept, uh, that real estate is infinitely valuable. It was purposely located there because of its proximity to the parkways and the highways, densely populated areas with high amounts of disposable income. Sound familiar? Those are Amazon Prime customers. And so, you know, there is 
that even if you knock down every retail store in a mall, that land inherently has a tremendous amount of value. It could be reimagined with streaming taking off and people cutting the cord. It could be uh, stages for movie studios. You could have data center spaces. You could have curbside pickup, dark stores, uh, delivery hubs, fulfillment centers. And then what I would call, if, if anyone on the call is familiar, particularly on the West Coast with uh, Westfield malls. I'm a huge fan of Westfield and their mall concepts. They have very high-end stores, Apple stores, Amazon Go stores. They have outdoor concert space and they, they've really turned going to a mall into uh, a, a mixed entertainment and not just a shopping experience. And so I see that, I don't believe that you're gonna, at strip malls, I have a lot more concern about the four, five, six, ten 10 stores in a row of what you're gonna be able to do with that. The, the mega malls on both coasts, I think that there's a lot of opportunity for either adaptive reuse uh, and or to just reinvent and use those for the acceleration of new, new technologies like cloud and e-commerce. That space will get gobbled up by Amazon or Target or Walmart or someone, but I think that uh, if you're in the small to medium strip mall uh, real estate business, I'd have a lot of concerns about what that could be reused for. So with these dynamics, uh, with jobs and uh, talent flowing to home or perhaps a mix of home and near home, uh, you know, we've all spent the last no, 15 years talking about the phenomenon of, of um, of, of concentration of assets of talent and otherwise in, in urban cores, diversification mm -hmm. of office space, uh, of occupancies. Uh, that's being reconsidered now of necessity. We'll see if, uh, with what kind of durability. Uh, but um, we also see that you know the ground floor of our cities is most impacted right now, as are the employees that rely on those jobs in retail and hospitality and other service sectors, uh, where there's a tragic of jobs, some of them uh, could be long-term, if not permanent. What's, uh, with all of these dynamics going on, what's your perception of the continuing role and vitality of our urban courts? How do they fit? I'm sorry, of our what? Of our- Our urban cores. Ah, I, you know, again, I, I, I personally think um, we shouldn't discount anything and really think in terms of what a, a, a technology network looks like and turn it into a network of places. There's a purpose for everything. And we just have to figure out what our employees want so that they have a value proposition. And if they live in the city, they're probably gonna want something in the city. If they live in the burbs, they're probably gonna want something in the burbs. And if we can take advantage of distributed work and create identities for, for, the, whole, every, for the whole network, then I, I don't see strip malls going away. I don't see the urban core going away. That's just my opinion. I just think we haven't gotten creative enough about how to put it all together into one big systemic um, portfolio of affordances for employees. I'd start with the employees and then create the container around what it is that they do in, in, in a concentrated way. Again, not just the onesie twosie homes. What do the rest of you think? New York City bounced back from 9-11 yep. and the real estate market there that everyone said would never recover. Uh, it, it bounced back and was relatively resilient. I think that you'll see backfilling of the residential vacancies uh, with some concessions, some notable concessions on the part of landlords and owners to get people into the higher vacancy rates uh, and or get those lowered as people move to the burbs. So I, I don't think that you're gonna be looking at a Manhattan that's a ghost town two, three years from now. You're gonna, what, what it is is maybe you've accelerated the folks that, you know, in New York, most of us, uh, and I am stereotyping, maybe got married a little bit later in life and were single, maybe a little bit longer than we should have been. But I think if one thing that this pandemic has done, it's accelerated where maybe some of the 20 somethings are moving to the burbs a few years before they've maybe even settled down or they're moving while they're still in a 
steady relationship or, or newlyweds and not moving to Westchester and Bergen and Long Island and the burbs of, uh, you know, Northern California, uh, they're not waiting till the mid thirties or their forties or, or whatnot. But I, I have to think that all of that is going to get backfilled. The retail uh, in the cities will get backfilled pretty quickly, but there, there's going to need to be some sort of correction because the, the, the rents, you know, particularly if you look like places like Hudson Yards, there's a handful of folks that have made a ton of money during COVID because of the tech boom. But for the rest of the world, you know, those rents have to come down and then they'll get backfilled. And then we'll, I think we'll regress back to the mean. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll just say, you know, I'm coming to you from New York City right now and apologies as my children walk in and out of the frame to Mike's point <laughs> earlier. Uh, but, you know, I think I, I agree. I mean, I'm kind of in the tank for cities a little bit. The one thing that I would just mention, and it gets back to something Anne said at the start of the session, is that I do think leadership matters. And we see, you know, for those of us working across cities, across metro regions, I think leadership can play a real differentiating factor in helping organize business leadership educational leadership, nonprofit leadership, all those pieces we need to, to make something like this really sing. And, you know, we, we see that. We see that all the time at, at J.P. Morgan. I had the occasion to uh, speak with a former New York City official, uh, long since retired, who was remembering uh, after the fiscal crisis in New York um, with the formation of the New York City Partnership and the historic um, collaboration between Public employee unions and uh, and uh, and and Jamie Dimon's uh, predecessor of a generation ago. Um, the question is, cities need that kind of collaboration at the top, with uh, public and private leaders, uh, community leaders engaging um, in a more diverse way than they have in the past, in order to be the fabric and have that longer perspective and willing to invest their institutions in longer term solutions. It's not clear what New York, whether New York has that right now, but um, crises have a way of, of begetting uh, heroes, uh, and hopefully uh, New York will find will find theirs. Uh, but nobody should bet against New York. It's 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 somewhere akin to betting against the Fed, and we see how how that's gone. Right, New York is uh, is is a, is is the epitome of resilience. Um, any other questions that we need to address? Because we are right on the wire of our, of, of our uh, time and, and, and in, in indulging your patience. Um, but our panelists, um, I, I'm gonna say, I do feel like we've barely scratched the surface here and um, we had more content here. Um, this may warrant an, uh, a sequel. Uh, <laughs> which, uh, I've, which, uh, I've, I've learned, I've, I've really enjoyed my, my colleagues and I think the questions have been terrific. So I, I hope we hit the mark. I think Jenny made the most important and insightful comment of the past hour talking about the need for public leadership. Totally. We, we need to have our mayors and our governors and our local officials really stand up and say that, you know, they care about communities. They have to have an opinion. They can't be agnostic to what's going on in the midst of a pandemic in terms of the impact on the rail systems and the transit systems and billion dollar deficits and people moving in and moving out. And it, it just, I see that there is, and this isn't to be pejorative, I see, I'll frame it in a positive way. There is an opportunity for, for more leadership to be shown that inspires people to take action, that inspires public-private partnerships to get people together to think and work and solve complex problems. But if you don't have people uh, leading, it's going to be very difficult to get to cobble together the type of groups that we have right now to come up with these solutions. So that is, th this is an open uh, letter and salvo to our leaders everywhere that we, we need you to have an opinion and to be deliberate on this. Yeah, we need, we need that's, that's an open letter addressed to uh, both uh, elected officials uh, as well as business leaders. There's a level of collaboration uh, that's needed that we've seen in, in times of crisis in the past. Um, 
but is sorely needed now. What we don't need is, is government demonizing business. We don't need business demonizing government. Oh, yeah. um, there's Which competencies all around. Uh, we need as much as we can get and as much good will and, and uh, collaborative spirit as we can all muster. So with that, uh, thank you all for joining our panelists, especially for those that organize this historic event. Um, this has been a great fun and illuminating, and I do feel like we've just scratched the surface. So hopefully we can continue to collaborate and discuss these issues going forward. Thank you all and have a great afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Jay. Thank you all. Thank you all. All done. Thank you, everyone. Bye.